So first of all, let me apologize if I start coughing. Uh, I come from Portugal and we're used to hot weather and the AC here cuts quite strong. <laughs> um, so yeah, first time in the summit, uh, having a blast so far. Anyone here also the first time? Okay. Uh, are you enjoying it? it I mean, it's, it's quite different. Um, yeah, so before we just jo start, uh, who here uses storage accounts or has knowledge about storage accounts as is before? Okay, yeah, quite many people. That nice. So today's talk is about leveraging Pastor uh, to, to automate storage account testing. Uh, I'll be talking about like the approach that I did, and after seeing other talks uh, during this summit, I found that I'm using Pastor quite a different way, like not the normal unit testing thing. Um, but again, that's part of the cool thing is that it's versatile. So again, yeah, my name is Daniel Silva. Um, down here you have all the socials that I use or don't use because I'm mostly offline from almost all of them. I'm a senior DevOps engineer at Relax, a Finnish company. Um, amazing to work there, honestly. And I've been from the past year since I joined, mostly focused in Azure and Terraform. Uh, more specifically, storage accounts, which led to, uh, was like a good part for, for this talk. Uh, again, first time at ND, um, having a blast so far, super tired. Um, I can get any more than five hours sleep, but yeah, it's all good. Uh, I'm also owner of two lovely cats, which um, love sleeping in weird positions for some reason. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, I mean, I've jumped on a trend. I don't know if you can read quite well. So I was having like a mental block on how to prepare this session. And I did what we nowadays usually do, like the new Google. I went to ChatGPT and asked it, asked it to explain me storage accounts in a simplified way, uh, sarcastically, but funny. And I had to remind it that it was for a session. So uh, it had to contend himself. So the attempt was that saying that a storage account for you, for those of you, you want me to go there? Sorry? Is Victor your brother? No. Okay. No relation? No. Okay. <laughs> Just last name. <laughs> so yeah, for those of you that don't know, uh, storage accounts are, um, well, pretty similar to S3 buckets, for instance, on AWS. It's like a place where you can throw all the files that you want. ChatGPT uh, says it's like having a closet that holds not only all fi your files, but allows, also allows you to uh, configure, can be configured to allow your friends or foes take a peek. So this is quite subtle, uh, but the thing is that the key here is, and we'll be uh, reaching out to that, it's once you enter in, like the storage account, you can go from the most simplistic way, like anonymous access, uh, uh, I mean, storage of, as a CDN, whatever, to go to like super restrict IP whitelist, subnets, private network access only, and things like that. So again, yeah, you can have your friends like IP whitelist or, or anyone or foes if uh, I would say like anonymous access. Um, then it goes one step further and says, again, firewalls and setups. It's like you can set up a virtual bouncer and allow or access deny. Um, you can whitelist and use other things like uh, require a special SAS, uh, access token, which it's called a uh, SAS token. Well, the, what's the catch with this? So yeah, once we start digging into all of this, um, testing this, and I, I won't be doing manual tests. Uh, I'll just show you like the amount of places that you have to go uh, if you have to check for all of those settings. Um, yeah, it's like it's like playing a game of words, although. Well, not only with the settings, but like looking through them through the portal. Uh, that's quite a lot of them. That it, and then it finished saying, uh, we got a secret, secret weapon called Tester that makes our life a lot easier. And it does. So as I was saying, what are the, the biggest challenges? So I separate into two major categories. So one of them is network. Um, you can allow, uh, or you can set up public access, anonymous access, and have firewall rules. 
Public access and anonymous access are two different things. So anonymous access means that you don't need any specific authentication to access to that resource. Whereas public access does not imply that it has to be anonymous. So for instance, if you set up like usual, uh, there, there's a lot of, um, a common use case which using as a CDN, it allows public anonymous access. Uh, you can have private access, but you, you, like you require your AD token or your AD user to access through that. Or you can have firewall rules set up to require a specific IP, a given subnet, or don't allow any access at all. The other category is uh, user access. So there are three major parts, I would say, uh, SAS token, service principle, and AAD access. So usually when you go through the portal, if you have the permissions, you're using AAD access. Uh, there's a, a switch on the top, which you can toggle uh, to change to, I think it's uh, service principle authentication. Then there's SAS token, which is not that secure, or I mean, it's not that recommended, uh, because it's basically a token that you have. Um, you can define it at a storage account level, or even at for each container have a different SAS token. The biggest issue is that if one of those secrets get compromised, you need to rotate what's the access key, which is the one that it's based uh, to generate those SAS tokens. So once one of your containers get uh, a SAS token gets compromised, you have to change all the SAS tokens for that. I don't know if you can see it quite well. Well, I can't zoom it from the, the slide, but this some of the parts that you need to look up if you are checking if everything is okay. So access control, uh, if your user has a, or in their service principle have access or not, what kind of access do they have? Do, are they owners? Are they storage contributors? Are they just contributors? Network settings, you can quite see some of the settings down there, uh, but you can just see if it's uh, allowed from any specific access or not. What's the number of private endpoints that you can have, but you don't know from there what are those endpoints. So you'd have to come to this blade part, go to the setting, change the tab. So yeah, doing this for one, it's okay. But when you start provisioning storage accounts like at scale, testing for all of those, it's, it takes you way longer than that. Then again, the SAS token part, which is just another component. Then there are, again, the public Bob access. Some of those are quite easy to see, but again, if you provision like 10 storage accounts or uh, for one customer, for three environments, you easily have like 30 storage accounts to go check manually. So for this demo, the setup that we'll be having, uh, don't get scared with this. The idea is that we'll be provisioning two customers just to provide like some sort of small scale. Each customer will have three environments, dev, staging, and prod. Each customer has one key vault where we store the service principal ID and the, the client secrets. Then we have for each storage account, we have two storage accounts, one that allows public access and one that denies public access. So they will each have their own SAS token. And again, what happens is if this IP, uh, let's assume that it's a runner or even our computer for this matter, if we have trying to access the storage account that has allow, it will access anyway. But if you try to see, to go to the one that has denied policies, it will try to check and get rejected. There is a caveat for this part. So when you're using storage accounts with uh, network rules, what happens is that IP whitelisting only, only happens at the storage part. So even if you have uh, IP whitelist set to uh, give some given IPs, you can still go check storage account and what properties it has. So you can still check if public access is enabled, if what, how many containers are there created, because the IPs are only applied to the container part, either that containers, queues, tables, or any other resource that the storage account can have. So yeah, only allowed to, to the containers, which means that this starts, this starts to be a problem once we try to run this on our CI CD because our runner shouldn't have access to the storage account, but if, if it doesn't have a, at least temporary access, how can we double check if once, when we run Terraform plan, um, we can actually try to modify that. And that's something that I got quite surprised because I've started seeing a lot of issues on GitHub from people saying that if the network rule was set to deny, they wouldn't be able to run Terraform uh, plan. And that makes sense because the, their IP wasn't whitelisted to access that. So we, we have to walk around that. And the high, high overview is that once our runner 
once our runner runs, um, it, it basically runs a pastor or runs a script that adds, check, goes check what asks what our IP to some given API. The API replies, hey, your IP is one dot whatever. We then set it to allow, we run a command that I'll show you then for a storage that allows you to uh, set up a rule saying, okay, so my IP, for this IP, giving, give the permission to run it. Then we run all the tests that we have, and after that we just run the same command, but instead of, uh, instead of add, we run to remove. I'll be showing all of this uh, in just a second. I'm just trying to get rid of all the slides so that we can go to the fun part. So 101 here for the setup. I don't know who here is familiar or, or yeah, who here is familiar with Terraform? Okay, so we, just for, for curiosity, we won't be looking into it unless we have time in the end and there's some, and, and some specific question. But yeah, I'll be using Star, uh, Terraform. Again, what we'll be doing is that, I mean, it already did because it already ran. Create for two customers, each customer has two storage accounts, each customer has two environments. And then we set up a key vault. We store, we generated a SAS token and a service principle and a secret. We store all of those on a key vault and then we sign permissions for those to access the storage account. One important point is that we'll, we'll be using a service principle as a part of identity. So when our CI runs, we need to specify the identity to run against or to run Terraform with. There are multiple ways to do this. Uh, I chose service principle that seemed uh, easy enough and secure to do so. And I'm leveraging naming conventions. So this is mostly in this, in this case for the demo, but I also try to apply this on my daily, daily work. So by using naming conventions, what I can do is that I just need to, all of these things that are set here between uh, these two characters, which I don't recall the name in English, uh, like resource abbreviation, things like that, those can be variables. And that means I, if I set them as variables, I just need to change like what's the customer name and all of the, all of the rest will work as supposed to. Now, the testing scenarios that we'll be running, it's essentially three, but two categories. One of them will be that we'll be using, uh, we'll test all the storage accounts after we're doing one release. So the flow is that the pipeline runs, it check, after it deploys, it will check like, can this, uh, can this user or can this service principal uh, upload and download a file? Can this service principal, you, you, or can this uh, SAS token upload and download a file? Those are the two cases that we'll be running. Then we'll be doing the same for, uh, let's say, let's assume you have one customer with uh, 10 storage accounts. It might be easier to just run one passer test that says, okay, so for this customer, test against all the storage accounts and check if we, the SAS token is still valid, if the service principle still has the same permissions, if you can upload and download the file. So it's, it's quite versatile what we can do. And that's the first uh, big scenario. The second one is uh, just more for fun. Um, and also to, to show you uh, other options that we have with, or what options that we have within storage accounts. So we can see, check for things like, is HTTPS traffic allowed, uh, or is the only thing that it's allowed? You can set up to uh, on or off. You can use for things like, what's the TLS version that it allows? It's, it's, if it's not 1.2, the test should fail, things like that. Public access should be, uh, should be disabled. And uh, you can also see if the, thing, the, the keys are not rotated uh, for the last, like, so let's say, 30 days. Any questions so far? So the question is, if I've been in a situation where someone is running a function app in consumption plan, and it does the, the storage account requires public access. Um, I have not, but, but what, what is the, the, the situation? Is it, it, it complains about something or? Okay, so the comment is that, uh, if I understood correctly, I'm not that familiar with, with function app, sorry, but the, the comment is that when you are in consumption plan, it's required that the storage account is uh, in a public uh, access. And uh, the issue is that if you have compliance that you need to have private uh, storage account access or you don't, you should put it the other way, you shouldn't allow public access, you come to like a dilemma if you should just upgrade the, the function app or uh, how can you solve that, is that it? 
for the for the for the record whoops for the recording what's been told is that you just have to upgrade the 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 function app plan I, I mean the first thing that i would say is that it, can't you uh, inject a vnet within that but if you are in consumption and you are saying that you can't then you if you answered my question then uh, but yeah if maybe that's only the the only solution sorry i don't have experience with function apps any other questions okay so <clears throat> So I, I will then uh, publish all of this within the, the, the GitHub. Uh, I'll share the link then. Or I mean, it will be on the, the summit uh, repo. So the folder setup uh, and what we'll be focusing, uh, these helpers are just for my part of the demo. This internal setup is if you want to run this um, then at home, uh, I try to make it so that you, I'll try to add a readme with instructions, but this internal setup is what I've used to create the initial infrastructure where I create a specific, a specific resource group for the, the summit, one service principle, one uh, storage, oh, sorry, one key vault uh, stored that secret there. So this set up the, the whole background thing. Then this infrastructure is uh, where we have the Terraform codes, where, where it will be doing what, I, what I've just been saying. Uh, is the font enough for the ones back, backward? Okay. So it do things like create a key vault, the, the secrets, uh, use my own users and permissions, create a storage account and all of that. Um, I, it's not the focus for, for this uh, session. And then the customers is just call it, Terraform calling uh, the infrastructure part with the given parameters. So if, uh, if you were at the lightning demo that I did um, two days ago, what I, what I basically did was uh, run the data generator command that I showed to create um, the JSON for, for these files for the demo. So the setup is quite simple for the Azure, fun the Azure parts. Uh, if, what, what I've been noticing, and I, I didn't have much experience with uh, AZ uh, PowerShell commands. So there is this the whole AZ package that will install basically everything. If you don't want to do that, you can just use AZ storage if you just want to interact with storage. I just went with the whole AZ thing because we are using storage, we are using uh, key vaults, we are using access networking things. So instead of trying to figure out what, uh, what kind of modules do I need, I just went with everything. Uh, so once we do this, it has like a lot of commands. So I don't know about you, but whenever I have to uh, start something different and uh, I don't know what, what kind of things available. One of the first things that I do is like I install the module and then I get I do like get command and just pass the the module and just look through everything that I need. So these are all the commands that we have within um, storage. Uh, it's not just storage accounts. It's everything that it's storage related, computer storage uh, and things like that as well. Data lake and so on. And as I was saying, throughout this session, we'll be using a service principle. So this is one of the ways, uh, and also in this case for the demo, uh, this is how I'm authenticating with the service principle. So I'm authenticated. And what I'm doing, I'm applying the same principle as I'll be doing with the customers. So I'm trying to get, uh, in this case, my service principle, the app ID for the service principle, getting the secret from the key vault that I've generated using that uh, initial setup part creating a credential object and using connect easy account with that service principle. So from now on, all the commands that I run within this terminal will be run uh, as that service principle called app provisioner. And we can start digging on what do we have for um, storage accounts. Oops. So I've, I have a demo uh, storage account so that we, we can see, and this was before I even created all the customers. And if I run this, I'm doing basically what I've been, what I've been telling that will be doing with the customers. I'm getting my current IP. I'm getting a storage account. Uh, in this case is a PS Summit demo storage account. And I'm trying to get all the storage account parts. So if I run this, uh, let me clear screen here because this will, I'll put quite some things. So it's not quite readable yet. So let's see 
if we do, again, those are the two, the two, my two favorite things that I like to do. It's get help with something and then get member to check uh, what, what do I want. So SaaS policy, we've been talking about SaaS, so these might be useful. Uh, key policy, key creation time, IDs, uh, replication status. I mean, it's just almost like what, whatever you want to imagine that you want to do it, you, can, you are just able to do with this. So I've selected some of the properties that might be useful. And those can be uh, allow, allow public access, like we were saying, that's one of the settings that we might want to check. If we allow the share access, uh, the SaaS tokens, what's the status for enable the HTTPS traffic? So if you run this, we get something like this object. And something that's interesting here is that we have the network rule set. And this is where we have all the settings for if we allow IP, what's the, the policy that we have? Is it to allow an, uh, any access, public access or deny it? So looking into this, this specific one, uh, storage accounts. So in this case, what we have is the default action is to deny access except for IPs that are defined here. So this IP is um, one of the IPs that I had from the, the, this venue. So if I go to IP rules, this is uh, the only IP that it's supposed to be allowed. Now, to double check it, what we can do is, there's this uh, strange concept at first about context. Uh, I don't know if you are, I think this is used on other uh, modules from the AZ team as well, but so basically the context is you are creating a context for your storage account. And then you, you further, uh, comments further uh, down below usually require to specify a context. And that's uh, one of those contexts can be, for instance, the authentication method, if it's a SaaS token or not. So in this case, I'm just creating a, a normal context for the storage account, and I'm trying to get the containers for the storage account. And again, because the only IP that it's allowed, it's not the IP that I currently have, I get this error saying uh, somewhere, this request is not authorized to perform this operation. So it seems to be working that I can't have any access. So I have this small function on top, which basically just, oops, not this one. It just runs the command that add the network rule saying, for this resource group, for this storage account, add this IP or this range of IPs. And I'm saying add my current IP for that. So if I run this, it says, okay, so it should say, okay, so your IP is now allowed and once I run this, I can have one of two outputs. So I've added the IP, but I'm still not able to access. The thing is that it might take some time to propagate. So what we'll be seeing in other, uh, the rest of the demos is that whenever I have one storage account that is a net, that it's set to deny, as soon as I see one, I'll just add the IP and then I wait for 30 seconds to wait for it to propagate. Now, I've tried to find a reasonable amount of time. Uh, sometimes it's like 10 seconds, sometimes it's 30 seconds. Um, I was... No, Siri, thank you. Um, sorry. Now, again, I've run it. it. I wasn't able to, now I I'm able to. Uh, my experience was that within the pipeline, 30 seconds usually is uh, the, the safest bet. So yeah, now I'm again able to check that. But the same happens if you, once you remove the IP. So it says that, okay, it's removed, but it might be that I'm still able to access it. So again, we, we would still have to wait for 30 seconds or something uh, to stop having that access. Oops. Okay, now it's having the, the correct behavior of not allowing me to do so. Does it make all make sense for you? Any questions? Okay. So moving on, let's, until now we haven't seen any Pester. Um, how many of you are familiar with Pester? 
Okay, quite a lot. So I didn't raise my hand because before this talk, I have never touched Pastor before. Um, but yeah, I think I've, I was able to achieve um, a decent scenario. So before we jump into the more complex test, um, there's a, a one simple test, and this is what I loved. I mean, this is why I also love PowerShell and I try to advocate it for everyone. Um, Again, I, I, I'm not that familiar with Pastor. I've been to some talks, I've seen people using it, uh, but I've never used it to this extent. But looking at this, I can quite easily understand uh, what it does. And one of the tests that I did was I just selected these and asked my friend, like, can you, can you tell me, oops, can you tell me, or can you try to infer what this will do? And he was able to tell me that it's supposed to be what, what, what I was saying. I mean, other than the fact that it's, uh, it says here what it will be doing. But again, so in Pastor we have like the describe blocks and you can specify context. And what I've done here is, I don't know how you usually approach Pastor tests, but uh, I did the bottom, the bottom up approach. So what I wanted to test was being able to upload the file and being able to download the file. So my first test was just having all of this block uh, down here and then once I started writing the download part, I saw like, yeah, 90% of it, it's the same. So then I was searching and there is this before all block. So there is before all and before each. Uh, before all just runs, well, it's quite obvious again. Uh, before all runs once before all the other tests run and before each runs before each one of those tests. So for my case, I just need to run it once. And for this simple test, what I'm doing uh, is I want to check if uh, I'm able to upload the file in the context of using a SAS token. So what I'll be doing, I'll, I need to find the name of the, that secret. I need to get that value from the key vault, assign it a value, create a file, upload that file, test if the value is not null, because if it's null, it means that the file wasn't uploaded. Because this uh, file upload result uh, returns an object uh, containing the information about the file that was uploaded. So if it's null, it means that the file wasn't uploaded. And then I try to download that for the same file. Um, I mean, I download the previously uploaded file and check for the content if it's the same. And because it's, again, the same file from my file system that was uploaded and then downloaded, uh, it should run. Then one important part is, after all, regardless of what's the output of the test, I want to delete those files from uh, my local file system. This is not as critical uh, for runners because supposedly runners are, uh, runners are ephemeral. So once you spin it up, it will be a new container and you won't have this context. Uh, but as a safe measure, uh, just delete that. Oops. So if we run this and this other part that I've learned that you probably already know if you run Invoke Pastor without specifying um, any file. It will run all the files that have the .tests.ps1. So this file before wasn't named .tests.ps1. So when I tried to run Invoke Pastor, it just said there was no test. And I'm like, I, I have the test in front of me. So what's wrong? Then I read, actually read the error, which is something that we should do, I've been told. And it says that you can't find, it can't find any pattern .tests.ps1. So once I was able to do that, I just ditched the, this test because it's the only test that I have in this folder. So running this should be quite fast and quite simple. And it says, uh, I'm not sure if, I, if you, okay, this might be easier to see for you. So why I'm using context and all of, the, all of that if it's just one test? Well, what I found is that context just have like a pretty way of outlining what are the, your scope of your test. So, the context is using a SAS token. It should be able to upload the file and it should be able to download the previously uploaded file. Once you have this on a different scope, like having multiple storage accounts, it gets quite a, a lot easier to see actually. Um, going then, so with all of this, let me show you the behind the scenes. I think it might be. So I'm using GitHub Actions. Um, I'm nowadays, unfortunately, more familiar with GitLab. 
so this is just a simple pipeline that does two things. Uploads, like it runs simultaneously for the purpose of this demo. It runs for all the customers. So there are two customers. It runs for each environment. So it's dev, staging, and prod, which means that we have six executions. And for each one of those, it runs Terraform plan, Terraform apply, and after once, afterwards, it runs uh, passer tests. So this is the latest execution. And if you see here, because the storage account was already created, um, all it did was changing the IP to be uh, the IP that we, I had in this uh, venue. But the important part for us, or what, the reason why we are here, is this sec run pester test section. So what's the goal? Um, it's arguable if these tests are any uh, good or uh, actually useful, because if you are creating a storage account and you are then testing uh, if the SAS token is valid and the service principle is valid, you are most likely testing if Terraform ran successfully, because it, this is just to give you a confidence, like if I run this and if all these tests pass, there's no way that someone can come to me saying, hey, this storage account doesn't work once you provided it. Uh, what's wrong with that? I can just come here and see, okay, so what I'm seeing is that the SAS token is, is valid. I was able to upload and download the file and the same happened with the service principle. Furthermore, I can ensure you that uh, because there is this storage account with a deny policy, and I'm sorry if this is too small, I can actually try zoom in. As you can see, because it says, because there is a, this deny here, I'll be at my IP and just wait for 30 seconds. And when I'm testing this storage account, I'm able to upload and download. So this gives me to some extent um, already some um, ways of saying if it's something wrong with my deployment or if it's something wrong with the customer side, for instance. Because let's say if someone's saying, uh, one of the, the, my colleagues is helping a customer and my colleagues say, uh, hey, I can access the storage account that you provide to the customer. And if I ask, can the customer? And they say, yes. Well, I can al already assume that maybe that customer has a policy to have the deny IP. Are, is your IP whitelisted? Or are you using the VPN or something like that? And th that will go like as an easy, uh, fast way to troubleshoot. So what we actually have for this, again, it's quite simple. So it's basically two pipelines or two files. Uh, it's running as a matrix to deploy everything at the same time. It's using the secrets, like I was saying, because we are running the Terraform part. And also for the pastor part, we need to authenticate as a service principle. So what we do is that we have secrets saying, this is the, the ID and the secret of the, the service principle that I have for this, this subscription and this tenant. And what test, what, what test it's actually running is, if I come here to this desktop folder. So there, there are two major or two different tests, again, that I was saying that we were going to see in this session. The first one is single storage account access. So this is the one that runs after a deployment. And it's a little bit more complex than the previous one, but it has some before all. Let me just, I think this is the command. So it, it seems like it's doing a lot, but it's not doing that much. Some of them is just for optimization. So for instance, as I say here, uh, if the, the default action as we've seen is set to be deny, we need to add the, the customer user. But if uh, there is no action to be denied, there is no need to run uh, an HTTP call that has uh, some overhead. So like five lines here is just to uh, avoid adding the IP if it's not needed. Then what, one of the, uh, the improvements regarding what we did previously was, and this for context, this is relevant. As I said, you have SAS tokens at the storage account level and at the container level. For this demo, I'm using the storage account level, which means I'm testing the storage account SAS tokens. So what I can do is, in order to avoid uh, doing any damage on the customer part, I will create a new container. This is the file that I'll be using to upload and download files. Uh, and then it's just the same context that we had before. So it's for the SAS token. It's this is the exactly same test that we've, we've just seen. And the second one is for the service principle. So for the service principle, it's a little bit different, 
what we do is almost the same, except that we need to authenticate at that service, that service principle. So for comparison, and as I was telling you on the other parts, when you create a new storage context, one of the parameters that you can specify is the SAS token. So if you don't specify it, it will be using any other mechanism of authentication, which means that for the storage account, you create it without having any SAS token specification because again, we are trying to use the service principle. <coughs> Sorry. But then the test is exactly the same. So it should be able to upload the file and should be able to download the previously uploaded file. The key difference is that we are authenticating as that service principle. One of the things that I've tried and um, I even asked on Discord uh, from PowerShell, all of this is the same regardless if, this, if it runs in this test or if it runs on the other test that I'll show next. So I was trying to uh, maybe over engineer and try to find a way to actually just remove this and place it in a central place where I could just inject that uh, into the test part. Uh, then there was a valid comment saying, but then you may, might be over-engineering or overly complicating the actual test scenario. And I agree to that, which is why I've just uh, propagated that by copy-pasting it. Now, again, same as the, pre the previous example, but in this case, this is uh, more important than before. In this, after all, regardless, again, of the execution or if the pipeline fails any time, we want to remove the network rule uh, so that our either, either our user, if I run locally, or the pipe, the, the runner, just don't have any more ac any access to the storage account. So one of the things that we can do by running a Jupyter notebook is this was the one. So single storage account after deployment. And ah, this is some, some interesting part. And I know there will be a um, Jupyter Notebook session with PowerShell, so I will attend to that. I'm not sure why, but what happens is it seems that context between uh, what runs inside the, the, this Jupyter Notebook and my current session is totally different. And I have some odd scenarios that if I don't run connect uh, AZ account like uh, here, I, I don't even know what kind, of, uh, what kind of user it's trying to run as. So I'm assuming that if I run this, it will ask me to authenticate myself. And now it should run successfully. The same happens, the same happens, uh, yeah, so now it's running successfully. The same happens uh, with the test I'll show later, but the oddest behavior is that it just detects two storage accounts when my user has permission for all the storage accounts. So I, I don't know what's, what's wrong with the context within the ConnectAZ account, but running this test should output the same as the one that we've just seen. So any questions so far? Nope, nice. So yeah, this will take 30 seconds. I mean, now that I've talked, it just successfully run. Then the other test that I was saying that we can see is uh, running for all, uh, all the storage accounts within a customer. So if you have a customer with just one storage account in an environment, that's fine if you want to go there and check it manually. Now, if you have one customer with 10 storage accounts or you have 20 customers each with five storage accounts, it can become, I mean, I guess you can try to guess how long it will take you for you to do that. Now we can actually test because I don't know if I don't run the, this AZ account again. I don't know if it will use the previous context from the previous execution or if it will start as a new session. So I'm not sure if this will succeed or if this will fail by this part. And this one, while it's still trying to execute, it's, I think it's the, the biggest one, but again, it does uh, way more things. But what I found interesting, and I think this is quite recent within Pastor, I think it's in Pastor 5. Um, for this case, I'm using, uh, for both cases actually, I'm using containers to be able to pass parameters. But then there is this before discovery, um, and I've got beaten by this quite sometimes. So before discovery runs even before all, and what I needed was 
I need to get all the storage accounts so that when I run my before all, I can actually iterate for each storage account and get information about with each, uh, each storage account. But then what's also interesting is that the scope of before discovery is totally different than the scope of before all. So once this before discovery, at least from my understanding, as soon as this before discovery uh, finishes, you've lost context of the storage account names, for instance. So what I have to do, I have to do something quite similar again by running the same command, but adding uh, some other property that I needed. But I can't reuse that one. And then I don't know uh, in which version it came in, but there is also this amazing part, which the way that I was able to scale the previous script to this one was basically having this for each. So all the code that is inside this context for service principle and for the SaaS token, um, if you run a diff on this, it will most likely be the same. What I did was I just added the for each for all the storage accounts that I get on the, by running the before discovery part. Um, so yeah, once you run this also, it's, uh, so here we have, yeah, we have exactly the same issue, but I won't be running it because I'm almost out of time, but it's the same. So connect easy account would basically run it for all the storage accounts. What I want to show you before I finish is the last one, which is the second example that we are going to see. And I can do this, uh, I'll just have it to default like 30 days. So say that you have a policy um, running or you want to enforce a policy, you can do this obviously within Azure by having actual Azure policies. Uh, but other way that you can do it, in this, just for the example, say that you want to have a scenario where you want to validate if a SaaS token or access key is rotated every 30 days or it's no, uh, their, their expiry, the, the, their valid use time is longer, not longer than 30 days. What you can do is having, this is running for all the customers, so all the storage accounts that I have, like in this case, it's 12 storage accounts because it's two customers, um, three environments, two storage accounts each. So it runs 54 tests in one second and it's validating as many things as blob access should be disabled, uh, only HTTPS traffic should be enabled. Uh, if the default action, so these two you can get by having Azure policies and you don't have to worry about it because you set it at, within your whole Azure uh, part. But it can be the case that you can have it that your team or your team's product doesn't want to allow public access, but other team is using a policy or using as a CDN. So you can customize that as well. But then you can start to go into more granular sections like if the default action is deny, at least one IP should be present. So why, is, why, why would you want something like this? So if you're providing this for, let's say a customer, and if they don't provide you any IP, what will happen is as soon as the storage account gets up, once, once someone tries to access that storage account, they won't be able to do so. So if you run this on the pipeline, for instance, it will fail. There are different times that you can run this, but this is just for an example. Then again, there are two keys when we talk about storage accounts, access key one and access key two. The, the goal is to have, you, you have one and then you have the two as backup. What happens is that once you want to rotate the first one, you, you before alert people saying like, hey, start using the second key, I'll be rotating that within 15 days, then you rotate it and you do the whole cycle. Now, because I create this, created these storage accounts uh, more than 15 days ago, I mean, actually, I think it was 15 and something. If I run the same, but for 15 days instead of the 30, what I have is supposedly a bunch of tests failing. So I've created all the storage accounts at the same time, so all of them are failing for the same reason. Expected value should be less than or equal to 15, but it's 15.5. So if you have this running, say, Azure Function App, uh, automation runbook, uh, anything like that, you can easily get reports, send email to uh, salespeople or wh whoever is dealing with the customer uh, in order to, to solve that part. Any questions? Because I think I'm finished from here. I mean, I could be talking another hour, but we are on time. So the goal, yeah, as, as you can see, like if, 
If you are not used to storage accounts, I mean, I get that you might not take that much from here. If you are using just for one or two seem easy purposes, um, I get that as well. But once you start going like at scale or providing that to customers, uh, using that within Teams, you want to ensure policies, enforce policies. One of the ways that I found, and this started as actually as like a, a side hobby thing, like I don't usually use uh, PowerShell that much, but within the, the, the comp within current job, but I was like, what if instead of doing this in like C Sharp that I know, uh, I don't want to do it in Bash because I don't know Bash. I can do it in C Sharp. I don't know Python, TypeScript. This seemed like, okay, but I can do like HTTP requests. I know that um, storage accounts are widely, or uh, PowerShell has a bunch of commands for uh, interacting with AD or AZ, sorry. So why not try to leverage from it? And it started to grow up to the point that I have like these scripts um, that, run for the purpose that I want, for all that matter. So if no further questions, all I have to say is thank you for attending. Hope you enjoyed it and hope you had fun at the summit.